Good morning, everybody. So I'll try to skip through the marketing stuff <laughs> because we have, I'm telling you that the presentation is a wall of text with a lot of information because this was supposed to be a workshop at the beginning, but then we didn't have time to prepare it because we had too many. So we decided that we were proposing, we decided to turn this into a presentation. So the goal is to give you information that you can follow up later on. So there are a lot of links to other resources, webinars, and things like that. And we try to basically talk about our experience in supporting companies, one way or the other, uh, that work with GeoServer and Precision Farming. So uh, you might know what GeoServer is, so I skip this as well. Uh, trying to set, let's say, the context and the key concepts. Uh, at GeoSolutions, we develop a number of open source products. One of probably the most important one is GeoServer. Other companies work on it, other contributors, but still, I mean, it's a very important piece of, let's say, work and business for us. We support right now a decent number of companies that are one way or the other working with uh, precision farming. Uh, the type of data varies a lot, and companies tend to focus on one or the other. A few focus on all of them, but most focus on one or the other. Some are working with EO data, they're more focused on longer term uh, forecasts and predictions. Some, they use it for doing uh, uh, real-time processing and indexes. Some focus more on drones. Some focus on field sensors, metal station, and so on. Think about wineries, I mean, when you have uh, like super expensive wines, you want to know the temperature and the humidity and everything. I mean, close to the sea, the salinity. Many people don't think about that, but it's an important thing to, to keep under control. And you need field sensors on the, on the wineries. Vehicle positions is more about intensive farming. Uh, it's not an important thing, for example, for Italy, because I mean, we have a few large uh, farms, but uh, US, I mean, Ukraine, obviously, <laughs> Russia, Brazil, uh, that is very important. We work with companies that work with meteorological models and more. Uh, deployments varies a lot, as you can imagine, because some are small startups, some are uh, large organizations that focus only on that, some are actually subsidiary of larger organizations that decide to branch off and focus on precision farming, so the things vary a lot. But in general, what we help this organization build, it's actually DAS solution. Data is a service. So they sell the data, usually as subscriptions, data, information, indexes, whatever, and we help them build these platforms, uh, focusing on the data we saw before. So usually we're talking about a lot of data, that it's continuously ingested or changes very frequently. Processing is done on top to come up with uh, additional information, dashboards, alerts, charts, whatever, uh, because you basically have to monitor uh, the environment one way or the other when you do precision farming. <clears throat> and the tools that you use to work on the environment, like the tractors, the vehicles, and so on. Everybody's heard the stories you know, about the tractors that were uh, remotely turned off uh, in Russia, whatever. I mean. Anyway, so uh, what are we going to talk about? We're going to try and address some of the things we have seen that can be challenging working in precision farming with GeoServer. And I mean, obviously tools around GeoServer, but we're focusing most on GeoServer because that's what, uh, what we do. It's too early to fall asleep. Okay, first thing, EO data. That's probably the most common. Uh, and it's actually where all the EO companies are pushing for. Uh, so we have a tremendous amount of EO data, both from the private sector as well as the public sector. Just think about Sentinel and Landsat. Uh, and then think about planet, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to find a, a use for them. The typical EO scenario is multispectral data. Sometimes it's also SAR data, because again, think about wineries, hills, you want to monitor landslides or potential landslides or land movements and you want to anticipate it. Because I mean, think about the wineries in Italy or in, uh, in France, even in Spain. Think about the ones on the Moser River. I mean, they are on steep hills, so you need to monitor them, okay? Uh, but most part of the time, it's multispectral and now hyperspectral data. I mean, I'm a computer engineer, so I don't know anything about the science behind it, and I'm not going to talk about it. Most part of the time, it's actually P2 
pure visualization or building the usual uh, uh, indexes with map and band algebra with uh, NDVI. Some companies, they focus only on individual imagery, although they ingest a lot of data, but I mean, they, they, they're always focused on the freshness data. Some companies, they work more with deep time series because they want to do comparison and analysis. I mean, one thing that you might have seen, for example, talking about wineries, because I, obviously, I mean, here in Italy, uh, it's a good example because they do many different things, and they usually have a lot of money, so, which, I mean, is not bad, and uh, they have to experiment. Right now, there is this huge push in order to understand how to cope with the fact that the temperature is rising, and this poses a, a huge threat to wineries because maybe you know, maybe you don't, but too much sun is actually super bad for the wine uh, because it increases the alcohol percentage, it changes the taste, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have actually to predict that in order to understand the exact period when you uh, cut the leaves, how many leaves you cut in order to not expose too much the grapes to the wine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so there is huge studies with long time series to understand what to do and what to do in the future. And for example, investors are starting to think about, yeah, we should probably start making wine, more wine in England or in these places <laughs> where, I mean, at the Roman time they used to make wine because the, the weather was different, but now they don't do it any longer. But maybe the conditions will be super good in a few years and there is money and the technical people to do it. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's also about planning. Okay. Typical mistakes that we see and what to do. As I told you, there is a lot of text and then a lot of links. I mean, the number one thing is uh, understanding the data you want to serve with GeoServer. Uh, we usually get involved with the, the usual question, GeoServer is low, what can I do, et cetera, et cetera. And 9% of the time, people have not optimized the data they are serving, especially when you're talking about EO. Uh, you should always optimize and there are uh, recipes afterwards. Uh, we won't give you a lot of details here, but I mean, you know what to do. GDAL, compression, tiling, overviews, these are things you can automate, especially if you ingest Earth observation data. I mean, as far as I know, yeah, they're sending a lot of satellites, but the good source is they don't change continuously. When you set up automation, you can ingest terabytes, actually petabytes of data, relatively easy nowadays with the tools that we have and the cloud infrastructure. So this is the first thing that we should look into. And for example, one thing that we do for some of the clients, uh, we, for example, usually duplication is bad, but in certain cases, you might want to come up with visualization ready versions of your data while you still keep the raw data. What does this mean? Let's say you have hyperspectral data or you have uh, even Sentinel, which is uh, 13 bands, if I'm not mistaken. It's always good to have some data which is prepared for quick visualization, even if you duplicate, which means you have all your uh, raw bands so you can do whatever index you want on the fly, but you keep RGB pre-processed, compressed, J JPEG, et cetera, et cetera, which is super fast and super small. So as, as I wrote at the end, do not fear compression, tiling, overviews. You need to do them. You need to do that uh, uh, as early as possible in your process. Sometimes you might need to sacrifice uh, space, like this space, etc., for performance, duplicating a little bit. And there is a ton of links of things that you might want to review if you're interested. There is also this document here, precision farming, whatever, which you actually brought for a few clients, and we decided to, to put it on the open. So it's like probably 70 pages of, uh, let's say, ideas and suggestions on how to do things with yourself. The other thing, this is, I mean, the first thing you might say, yeah, I mean, it's obvious. Everybody makes these mistakes at the beginning, not optimizing data. So, uh, believe me, it's not that obvious. I've seen people trying to serve a 500 gigabyte uh, DTM out of GeoSer with no overviews, uh, yeah. single line image, a uh, GeoTIFF. I mean, it's, it is low. I mean, I'm actually surprised you are able to see something. No? Anyway, the other thing is, you need to organize your data in GeoServer one way or the other. And this is true for any server. I'll go directly to the similar, the simple example. You start with GeoServer, you start publishing, you collect your data, I don't know, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-1, Landsat, and you start publishing a single layer every time you get an image. At the beginning, it works very fast. After five years, you have uh, 10, 000, 10 million layers. 
the gag capabilities explode because it becomes one gigabyte and most part of the time you're not able to generate it. It's impossible when you restart your server, it takes five minutes, etc., etc. Why this, ha this happens? Because you didn't, I mean, when you start with a database, well, I mean, they told me in software engineering you should do, you know, normalization, etc., etc. but you always do a little bit of modeling. You just don't throw all the time data at the database. Maybe someone will not agree with NoSQL, etc. but still, it's always good to think about what you do before you do it in general. So the same approach should be used with GeoServer. You need to try and organize your data. If you see that your data is actually a, a harmonized flow of similar data that changes o over time, like a time series, you should probably build a time series in GeoServer. So a single layer holding a petabyte of data rather than one million layers for the same amount of data because it will, it will become impossible to search. So again, these are very simple suggestions, but I've seen many companies struggling with this because then what happens? You build clients on top, you make the assumption that the structures of the layer is a certain structures, going back and changing the structure to use image mosaic, like a time series layer, it's almost impossible because you need to rewrite the client. So you end up doing all of sort of gateway in the middle because you restructured yourself, but you can't rewrite the client, et cetera, et cetera, so you add even more layers of problems. The solution we usually use in this case, and there is a number of uh, uh, information here, is to use image mosaic. We'll see a little bit more afterwards. Basically, image mosaic, and there is similar tools in other software like Map Server, et cetera, allows you to have, instead of many, many different layers, when you are collecting some remote sensing data or we do it also with drone data. I mean, whatever raster data you have, it is more or less current, and you can add multiple dimensions. It can be time. It can be other dimensions. For example, for drones, you would see we use flight ID, so you can get more drones data inside the same container. You should do it. So you can end up having 10, 15, 20 different layers with a time dimension, more or less constant, and you can use a REST API to ingest and delete data. You could have, for example, uh, uh, a Sentinel-2 data with the row bands, and then you see there are uh, ways to actually do uh, band algebra and build the indexes on the fly. And you might have on the, on the side an RGB Sentinel-2 layer that you keep ingesting uh, uh, Sentinel data all over the world, and you use time and, uh, and other uh, indexes, sorry, other dimensions, via WMS, via WCS, etc., to, to access the data. So this is super important. Also because it will help you uh, with, uh, with clustering. We'll talk about that later on. And then caching. Uh, usually when people see things slow, they say we should cache. Yes, but I mean, it's not a mistake that I'm talking about caching after the rest. Caching is the last thing you should do before you have improved that anything else. Because otherwise, it will lie to the problems for a little bit and it will make them worse to solve afterwards, okay? And people tell me the solution is caching. I always tell them, yes, but did you optimize everything else before? If not, you need to go back, okay? Once you have optimized the data, the structure is uh, more or less optimal, yes, you need to cache. You usually start with tile caching, so server-side caching, and then if you can, you need to look into uh, HTTP caching, so browser caching, if you know what I'm talking about. This is super important. Uh, just to put together the three things, uh, people might say, but if I cache things, I don't need to uh, optimize the data. Well, not always. I mean, in my experience, actually, you should. Uh, in very few cases, I mean, you only rely on caching. Uh, because under load, caching per se doesn't improve things. It actually augment the amount of work that you need to do on the server. Caching works very well, as I usually say, if you reuse the cache a lot. But it has an impact, because you need to do some processing, you need to do uh, some stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's important that you optimize first. What you need to look for if you put together the, the dots is actually a structure where your data doesn't update, but it's appended all the time. So every time it's easier to cache because when you have a new image, you're not replacing a new, something and for the same URL you get the same image. If you use a time dimension, things like that, every time you look at something, it, it's a different URL. And this is the, the perfect thing for caching. 
I'll try to skip some of this to go to the deployment. Well, COG, we use a lot, COG lately. Uh, here there are a little bit of information on, uh, on how to use it. Now we just have a support COG for uh, S3, Google Cloud, and soon Azure, natively. Uh, it works both for uh, pure GeoTIFF as well as Image Mosaic. And if you can use object storage, I would use it. Uh, it won't give you a performance boost over you know, super fast disks, but in terms of scalability, et cetera, it's the way to go. And I mean, we have had companies go from, for example, on AWS EFS to S3, you can save like an order of magnitude of money, okay, with decent performance. Uh, this is what I was talking about, uh, image mosaic. Uh, again, uh, there is no time to go into details, but there are links or resources for anything. The goal when you organize your data is to have the number of layers in GeoServer more or less constant, but to have them as containers with dimensions so you can add continuously data to it, possibly in an append way or in a moving window way. So you add the remove or you simply add, okay? We have had clients with petabytes data set, so they've been adding a lot of data for a, for a huge amount of time, but if you only focus on a narrow window like no casting or things like that, you can just have a moving window. But having the, a moving window is important. For example, uh, for what I said before, for caching. Uh, so having dimensions, et cetera, et cetera. These obviously might make your client a little bit more, more uh, complex, but still. Uh, this is interesting. GS7 support uh, map algebra. So in order to reduce uh, the amount of pre-processing you have to do, uh, for example, again, there wasn't an example at the beginning. Most of the easiest indexes, they can be computed on the fly if you have the raw data. You can also compute the RGB, uh, but usually what we do, the RGB, we, the RGB we pre-compute it for performance reasons, and then all the others we compute them on the fly. Because, I mean, it's a lot of combinations. It would take a lot of time to, to compute them all. And if you pre-process your data, this is going to be fast. If you don't, it's going to be even slower than the, than the normal data, obviously, because this is adding more computation every time you, you open a pixel. But I mean, if you optimize the data and you do proper caching, this will be super fast. Drones, I will probably skip part of it. I told you, I mean, uh, there, there is a lot of stuff. Uh, the interesting part about drones, you can use the same approach. We usually use it with time and flight UUID. Because even from drone data, you can more or less make a conceptual model for similar data and have a container for it. So you have a single layer and you select which scenes you want to do, you, you, you want to view or, or process using flight IDs, et cetera, et cetera. An interesting thing, when you we talked about raster data, vector data, uh, usually you have also vector data on the side. For example, processing that you did on the EO scenes or on the drone data, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to find a seamless way to view the two things at the same time. We tend to use this approach of having what we call single, single large tables partitioned on the same dimension we were talking about. Think about time, flight to UAD, et cetera, so that you can access and we're talking about post GIS, obviously. Quickly, portions of this vector data out of super large tables. Uh, you shouldn't be scared about having tables in post GIS that are super big if you organize them properly. And this is what we do part of the time. What we are experimenting with is actually a mosaicing approach. It's not being released yet. Similar to what we do for raster data, using flat GeoBuff or, or other uh, uh, streaming uh, formats for vector data so we can put them in a stream and save a lot of money. Uh, IoT is similar things. Uh, one thing that I want to say, we have a number of companies that started with Elasticsearch for IoT data and uh, our experience is mixed, to be honest. It can be super good and super bad depending on your experience and how you organize the data and how you want to visualize the data. The one thing I can tell you, Elasticsearch is a perfect use case if you want to get a small data set out of an enormous data, data set. If you are trying to visualize one million points coming from Elasticsearch, maybe you're doing something wrong because it's, you're moving one million JSON points, et cetera, et cetera. So 
this is going to be super slow and there is nothing you can do. You can actually do aggregation, geohashing directly in, uh, in Elasticsearch, but if you really want to see all those points, and I mean, there are reasons for doing that, something like PostGIS is usually much better, okay? I'll go a little bit to the deployment part. I mean, this, this would be probably a workshop per se. I'll say something and then I'll, uh, I'll stop. I'll, I'll stop in uh, like 10 seconds. I started from the resources because we could talk for hours about this topic, yeah. okay? There is a huge amount of uh, uh, material and documentation on the web. Uh, I put together some things in the slides, but this is actually the most important thing. And there is no way, there is no way around. You need to have a look, but first, uh, a few words. Uh, cloud and GeoServer, yeah, you can do it. Obviously, it's not, it's not uh, cloud native, but I mean, there are efforts in how to improve this, like the GeoServer cloud uh, extension. And there is, I mean, we have been running GeoServer everywhere. So, I mean, and with a huge amount of data, I don't think anybody uses it as millions of uh, concurrent users with any GIS application uh, that I know, but uh, we have reached, we have peaked at 20,000 concurrent users, so I mean, it can be done. Uh, let me see, there is a few things. If this is important, and then I stop. Let's put things together, optimize the data, uh, a good concept on model, caching, and then you need scalability and availability. Okay? Because first you get performance, like speed, and then you, can, you need to scale. So you need to cluster, possibly auto-scaling, etc., etc. If you do things properly, you don't need anything super fancy to scale GeoServer. Because if you think about what I said, you, keep ingest, you can keep ingesting terabytes of data per day without having to touch GeoServer, simply using the REST interface or publishing data in the database if it's vector data. So GeoServer can auto-scale. You can have your configuration in GeoServer, you can build containers, and you can auto-scale up and down continuously. That's why if you now put the pieces together, we try to have the structure where you don't create new layers continuously, but you publish data to existing layers. So you don't touch the GeoServer configuration. GeoServer simply adds new data uh, behind the scenes to the image mosaics or to PostGIS, and you keep serving. And if the data is incremental, you don't even need to truncate any caches before seeing new data. You can do that in background because data will fall out, you know, the interesting part and you can truncate the cache. So this is the simplest way of caching GeoServer. We call it back office production and we use it in 95% of the time. And I think that's it. As I said, I mean, there is a lot of stuff, but uh, I mean, there are links to documentation and everything. Uh, we don't have any questions.